Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. So you already know that the last two days I made a mistake. This is the last episode that I made a mistake, but I started sorting it out in this episode. So when you see my brain melt in this episode, you know why, because I'm suddenly remembering all these things. They're flooding back from years ago that for whatever reason, my brain decided not to recall while we were recording these episodes. Haggai and Zechariah are not necessarily contemporaries of Ezra. Ezra came to Jerusalem later. Doesn't mean that they didn't meet. But Ezra, when he's writing about Haggai and Zechariah, it's not necessarily from her firsthand experience. He's writing more as a historian of what happened prior to him getting to Jerusalem in Ezra 7. Sorry about the confusion. Hope that that straightens it out for you. And look, if we get something else wrong, we'll let you know and we'll fix it. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the episode. All right. Well, today we are back in Ezra. Uh, we jumped over to Haggai for a little bit. We didn't jump over to Zechariah just yet because uh, there's a lot I want to cover in that. It's going to be addressed a little bit differently. But Haggai, Zechariah, Ezra, all kind of working at the same time. Let's pick up again where we read two days ago in Ezra 5. And it says this. Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the sons of the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel... Uh, the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua, so we're about to call him this guy Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak or Jozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that's in Jerusalem. We saw that, right, yesterday. So this was uh, the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year of Darius the king, right? That's what we saw yesterday. And so they begin to rebuild it. Now, Tatanai, this guy, the governor kind of of the land, not the governor of Jerusalem, that's who Zerubbabel is, He's like, I don't want y'all to be rebuilt. So they've asked, who told you to do this? Who told you to rebuild? And he's, this is like a, this is like the kid in class that thinks it's their job to kind of keep everybody in line and just coming up. I imagine I'm like being really arrogant with his clipboard. He's like, who put you in charge? Who, look, tell me your name. And you know, he's like, I don't know. He's just kind of a, a, a jerk. So anyway, he sends a letter to Darius the king. And this is the letter. I'm going to begin in verse seven. To Darius the king, all peace. Be it known to the king that we went to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God. It is being built with huge stones, and timber is being laid in its walls. This work goes on diligently and prospers in their hand. And then we asked those elders, I'm sorry, I'm reading it kind of snarky because this is how I imagine him writing it, right? We asked those elders, uh, and, they, and we spoke to them and said, who told you to build this house and to finish its structure? We also asked their names for your information that we might write down their names of their leaders. And this was their reply to us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. We are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago, with a gr which a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried away the people to Babylonia. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, Cyrus the king made a decree that this house of God should be rebuilt. And the gold and the silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, these Cyrus the king took out of the temple of Babylon and delivered over to the one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And he said to him, take these vessels, go and put them in the temple that's in Jerusalem and let the house of God re be rebuilt. Then this Sheshbazar came and laid the foundations of the house of God that's in Jerusalem. And from that time until now, it has been in building and it is not yet finished because remember it had laid dormant for a while. Therefore, if it seems good to the king, so this is Tatanai again, therefore, if it seems good to the king, let search be made of the royal archives there in Babylon to see whether a decree was issued by Cyrus the king for rebuilding this house and let the king send us his pleasure in this matter. So basically, he's a tattletale and he's writing to King Darius and he's like, hey, we just took all this information for you. Go and check and see if these guys are on the level and then let us know so that we can handle it. And so then Darius the king made a decree and a search was made in Babylonia in the house of the archives where the documents were stored. And he says this, he writes a letter back. Uh, no, sorry, this is the document he finds. And it says this, in the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt. Let the place where the sacrifices were offered, let its foundations be retained and its height shall be 60 cubits and its breadth 60 cubits with three layers of great stones, one layer of timber, and let the cost be paid for by the royal treasury. Let the cost for the temple building be paid for by the king. So he's, then the, then this is King Darius back to Tatanai, verse six. Now, therefore, Tatanai, governor of the province, you and your associates, associates, all the governors who are beyond the river, keep away 
let the work of the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild the house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding that you shall do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house of God. All the cost is to be paid for these men in full without delay from the royal revenue and the tribute of the province from beyond the river. In other words, you're supposed to pay for it. Provide for them and pay for everything that they need. Whatever is needed, bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as present as the priests of Jerusalem require, let that be given to them every day without fail, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven, and that they might pray for me the life of, of, of the king. Pray for me and pray for my sons. Also, I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his House shall become a dunghill, a latrine. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or any people who try to alter my command or to destroy this house of God that's in Jerusalem. I, Darius, make this decree. Let it be done with all diligence. I would have loved to have seen the face of Tatanai as he gets this letter. Can you imagine, right? Like, this isn't like he goes to his post box, you know, or his mailbox, post box, post office box or whatever. It's not like he goes and has a letter from King Darius. Somebody, a servant of the king of Darius, brought this to Tatanai and he gets it. And he's like, oh, we'll see what Darius is going to say now. And it's probably been a couple of months since his letter got to Darius and came back. And he's like, let's see what Darius says. And then Darius concludes this with, not only are you to pay for everything that they need, not only are you to supply all their sacrifices, if anyone's opposed to this, let their house be ripped apart, let a beam of their house be implanted in the ground, and impale that sucker on the pole. And I just, I would have loved to have seen Tatanai's face. What a, what a, I don't know, it's kind of funny. So then according to the words sent by Darius the king, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and all their associates did with diligence what the king ordered. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by decree uh, of the God of Israel and by the decree of Cyrus. And the house was finished on the third day in the month of Adar. I don't know what month that is. I can't remember. In the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So we know that they started on the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year. So it took you know, like what, three years and eight months to rebuild the temple? Three years and eight months. Uh, but that's not really true. Because why? Well, because they had laid the foundation several decades earlier. This is why in Jerusalem, they say it took 46 years to build this temple. Because they started with the idea of when the foundation was laid. So the actual building of the temple, the foundation got laid and then nothing for decades and then they built the rest of the temple in a little over or a little less than four years. Uh, so anyway, uh, interesting. I love this. And then they keep the Passover. And then one of my favorite texts ever. Uh, this is Ezra chapter seven. And this is interesting. I want to show you this. In verse one, it says, Ezra, the son of, the son of, the son of. And if you go all the way down, Ezra is the son of Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest. And so Ezra is a direct descendant of Aaron, the, the brother of Moses, is a direct descendant of the line of the priest. And it says, this Ezra, this is verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel had given, and the king granted him everything he asked for, for the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And he went up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers and the temple servants. Now, this is interesting because Ezra 7, he goes to Jerusalem in the reign of Artaxerxes, Ezra does. And so Ezra, I said Ezra and Haggai and Zechariah are contemporaries, maybe. They're kind of all happening close to the same time, but Ezra is also a historian. And, and these first early chapters of Ezra, I may have misspoken. It might not be that they're contemporaries, because let, let me say it this way. Let me back up. And we can't fix it now. It's too late. We're not, I'm, I messed it up. So Ezra is coming in, in not the reign of Darius. Ezra is coming in the reign of, of Artaxerxes, and he's coming to Jerusalem. He's going to be a contemporary with uh, um, Nehemiah. That's what I meant. Ezra is a contemporary of Nehemiah. And, and the thing that's interesting about it is like Ezra, like I told you, the book of Ezra covers many, many years. And so Ezra is coming back now to the, to the house of the Lord. And he's, he's bringing all this stuff. So all the stuff that Cyrus had said was supposed to go. So listen, 
This is interesting. So Ezra comes to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which is the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was on him. And I love this. For Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it, and to teach his rules in Israel. So Ezra is a student of the Lord. He's preaching and teaching correctly the things of the Lord. And King Artaxerxes says this. Artaxerxes, the king of kings, says to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, peace uh, and na- peace to you, and now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or of their priests or of the Levites in my kingdom who wants to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Jerusalem and Judah according to the law of your God which is in your hand. Also, carry the silver and the gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God. So he takes all this stuff and he takes all these things from, from the, the king uh, to, uh, he takes all these things from the king to Israel, to Judah. L- look at this. Ah, crud. I skipped it because we've already covered it. So, so look at this. Ezra gets to Jerusalem and it, and it might be that Ezra, so like Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem twice and it might be that Ezra has gone to Jerusalem twice, but Ezra gets back to Jerusalem, and we're going to see Ezra a lot in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra gets back to Jerusalem, and one of the things that he notices, and so he's there by the command of the king, he's there preaching and teaching to the people, and one of the things that Ezra notices is that the people of God have intermarried with the Canaanite people. And so look at this. This is Ezra 9, beginning in verse 1. Nehemiah is going to cover the exact same thing, because Ezra and Nehemiah are absolutely contemporaries. Uh... Ezra and Haggai and Zechariah have some overlap. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. So God had forbidden his people, the Jews, from intermarrying with the people of Canaan, and they've married the people of Canaan. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the people of the lands. And in his faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak, and I pulled hair from my head and my beard, and I sat appalled. And all who trembled at the words of God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. So the the exiles who had returned during the reign of Cyrus and during the reigns of Darius, they had begun to intermarry with the Canaanite people. And Ezra is so distraught over this, he rips his clothes and he pulls hair out of his head and out of his beard, right? And that's interesting because Nehemiah addresses the exact same issue in Nehemiah 13, 25, exact same issue. And Nehemiah is so distressed over it, he beats other people and rips the the hair out of their beards. And it's such a funny thing because you you have Nehemiah, the governor, and you have Ezra, the priest, who both respond to this sin with outrage, and Ezra beats his own breast and rips out his own hair, and Nehemiah beats the other people and rips out their hair, but it's it's the same sin, and it's just really funny. Um, I I am more of an Ezra when I see sin. I get distressed, and I typically like I I feel that angst, and I have a buddy who's like, man, I'm Nehemiah. I'm just ready to rip beards out of people's faces, <laughs> and so like, but the response to the same sin anyway. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting with my garments and my cloak, and I fell upon my knees. I spread out my hands to the Lord, saying, O God, I am ashamed, and I blush to even lift my face before you, for our iniquities are higher than our heads, and our guilt has amounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt, and for our our iniquities, our kings and our priests have been given into the hand of the kings of the land, to sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place that God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. So he goes, for, we've been given this brief moment, this reprieve to rebuild the temple, to come back into Jerusalem, to establish ourselves again. And he says, but we are slaves because rem- remember, they're still under the Persian control. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, to give us protection in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurities of the people of the land with their abominations and filled from end to end with their uncleanliness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters 
daughters for your sons. Do not seek their peace or prosperity that you might be strong in the land that God is giving you as an inheritance. This is a, a quote back. It's, it's, it's a reference back to something that Moses said and also something that Joshua said to the people as they went into the promised land. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, O our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the people who practice these abominations? So, so Ezra weeps and he repents. And then in Ezra 10, what they do is they take a few months to go family by family, house by house, and take a census of the people to see who intermarried with these other races, and they force them to send away their foreign wives and send away their foreign children. And, uh, and, and so that is the sin that is dealt with here, that these people have are still disobeying God. They have never quit disobeying God. Since they left Egypt, they've been disobeying God, and, and they will continue to do so. Tomorrow, We'll jump into Nehemiah and we'll catch up on some of this as well. So join us in tomorrow, tomorrow in Nehemiah and we'll do Nehemiah in a few parts. Have a good day. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.